Good evening. Hello, everybody. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all our iniquities, and he heals all our diseases. Isn't it wonderful to know and be in relationship with the Almighty God? Oh, it's a wonderful thing to know him and to be known of him. We've been talking about the 12 men that he called alongside. And we notice how that he went in prayer and he prayed all night. And after prayer, he called or he uh, selected these 12 men. I don't know the timeline exactly because we see so much happening in the timeline, but we know that he intentionally called these men to be with him. That it was a pur purposeful decision. And what we have been really looking at is that the men that he called were so diversified. They were so different in many ways and somewhat alike in others. But regardless of their diversity, he called them and unified them. So when we look at the church today, we see diversity. In the church as a whole, great diversity. And in your individual local assembly, there is diversity. And we understand that sometimes people don't quite get the diversity. They like for people to be the same, to look the same, to act the same, to think the same. And there is a sense in which we all come together in unity, in mind, and in spirit. But that does not mean that there's not diversity amongst us. And so Jesus chose 12 men. And we've been looking at these men. And we're going to pick up today looking again at one of them. Um, and that's um, Philip. We looked at Peter. We looked at Andrew. We're going to look at Philip. And the Bible mentions Philip a couple places. And we saw some of that when we looked at Andrew because Andrew and Philip are often mentioned in the same context. But we're going to dig a little deeper into Philip's life, his character, his personality, and see a little bit of the differences between him and Peter and Andrew. Come on. You ready to get started? Let's get started with asking the Lord's blessing upon us as we study this portion of his word. Father, thank you that you have given us your word to study, and we just appreciate you so much that just like you call the disciples, and they were so different in so many ways, so you have also chosen and called us. Help us to realize that even though there is diversity among us, we are one, unified in Christ Jesus. So God, help us to endeavor to keep the unity that you have given to us. We ask your blessing upon this time of study. Open our eyes to behold the wonders of your word. Open our hearts to receive our minds to understand. God, and we thank you because you sent your word and your word prospers in everything that you sent it to do. So we thank you, God, for the prosperity of your word. We thank you because your word will find us right where we are. Your word will find us. So thank you for what you are accomplishing in us today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when we left off talking to you, we were talking about Andrew. And um, we saw that Andrew was Simon Peter's brother. And even though Andrew was called before Peter, Peter had a prominent place. He was among the inner circle that Jesus had. And let me say something to you a little bit. We, we're going to hit this again, probably in more detail, when we talk about James and John, the other set of brothers. 
Because there's an inner circle does not make them a clique in the sense of what we call cliques. Sometimes there are cliques in churches. I think we all know that. But every time that there's a group of people that are close or a group of people, a smaller group more maybe than a larger, don't be so quick to call it a clique. Sometimes your insecurity or because you're not included in that group, you're quick to call them a clique. And that may not be the truth. You abide where God calls you and be happy where God calls you. Let God deal with you. Andrew was before Peter, but you don't see jealousy in Andrew. You see humility. Um, if people are ostracizing you, I'm not saying that it wouldn't hurt you, but I am saying let God deal with them. Don't you get upset and run away from the church because you're not included in a certain group. You are in the heart and on the mind and in the hand of God. Now, I know that there are sometimes certain times in your life or in different one's lives that they may be called upon to leave a certain congregation, but don't leave your church because somebody else is pushing you to leave. Don't leave your church because you have misunderstanding. Don't leave your church because there's diversity. Let God direct your path. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Just threw that in for a little bit. Maybe somebody needed to hear that. Maybe you're thinking about changing membership. I don't know who you are or where you are. But before you do anything, will you please pray? Will you seek God and ask God what is it that he wants you to do? Where is it that he wants you to serve? And don't let people intimidate or manipulate you into doing something that they want you to do. I'm sure that if you seek God, God will give you an answer. He will make known to you. Maybe through someone else, very much possibly. Maybe even through his word. Whatever way you seek God and make sure that you're not doing it out of wrong motivation or misunderstanding. If you have to talk to your pastor or talk to someone in your church, talk to them. Sometimes, okay, I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> I just, I don't even know why I went there, but God does. And so if I'm talking to you, will you listen and seek God? And let God direct you. Because here, you see, Andrew just humbled himself. God chose Andrew. It didn't matter that Peter, James, and John were with him in the inner circle. When, uh, when he went on a mountain, he took Peter, James, and John. He didn't take Andrew. He didn't take the other disciples with him. When they went further in the garden, he took Peter, James, and John. Come on, y'all. Don't be jealous of another person's position. Don't be envious of another person's gift. Don't despise someone else because of the grace that God has given them. He's given you what you can do. What he can do through you. And it doesn't have to be the same as what he does through someone else. He does what he wants to do like he wants to do it. And let me tell you something. If you follow him, you won't lose your reward. If you look for reward among people, if you look for praise from people, they often told me the same people that put you up there put you down. You better find your place safely in the arms of Jesus. Let him run your affairs. Let him rule your life. Let him place you in the body where he wants you to be. When I was thinking about that, 
um, a little bit um, earlier today, I thought uh, how Jesus, in his choosing of his disciples, in the unity that we have, in, in Romans and in, in Corinthians, when they talk about the body of Christ, and I look at these disciples that we have already talked about, Peter and Andrew, and I said, Peter is kind of like a mouthpiece, you know. Remember we talked about Peter, his impetuousness? He was always talking, always had something to say. But we looked at Andrew and said, Andrew wasn't the mouthpiece so much. He was more like the eyes. He could see when, when nobody knew what to do when Jesus asked about the feeding of the 5,000. We're going to come to this. It was Andrew who knew. Andrew who saw that there was a young lad there with two fish and five loaves of bread. Andrew was the one who he could tell Jesus, but there's a lad here. And what the lad has. He had to have been observant somehow to have known that. So you don't have to be the eyes or the mouth. Maybe you can be a little bit like Philip. Philip is the thinker. He's the inquisitive one. He's the one. I'm not saying that others don't ask questions, but let's look at Philip, okay? And see some of the in-depthness of Philip. When we look at Philip, we see that he's a very inquisitive person. He, he loves to ask the question. He digs deeper. Peter is impetuous. But Philip thinks. He asks questions. He analyzes. Thinks things through a little bit more. Isn't it wonderful? That you can have people who can sit and listen and, and kind of see where this is going. How this, you don't need everybody jumping on the bandwagon right away. Somebody needs to sit back like the church that, that Paul talked about in Acts. When they were more noble than those of Thessalonica, the Bereans. Because they sat back and they questioned and they looked at the scriptures and they went through them. And so here you see uh, Philip. Let me tell you something else about the three men that we've already talked about. Remember, Andrew listened to John the Baptist when he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And so Andrew just followed him. When Andrew followed him, he went and got his brother. So you see, Andrew followed from a testimony and went and invited Peter. Peter evidently didn't hear John's testimony about who Jesus was, but he was invited to follow, and then Jesus called him. Some people will listen to your testimony and will follow Jesus because of your testimony, your word, and your actions. They will become disciples of Jesus because of you. Because they see you walking the walk. They see you talking the talk and living the life. And they will want to follow Jesus because of you. Because of your testimony. That's one of the reasons why it's important to give your testimony. Because somebody will hear it and will be persuaded. To follow Jesus because of what you said. Oh yeah, what God has done in you is for a purpose of bringing someone else. So look look here, when we look at Philip, it says in John 1.46, The day following, Jesus will go forth into Galilee. And this is the day after uh, he met with Andrew and Peter. And he told Peter who he was. And Peter... They call you Cephas, but I'm going to call you Peter. It says, and the following day, they would go, Jesus would go forth into Galilee. He findeth Philip. And he said unto him, follow me. Here is a difference right away. He finds Philip. 
Jesus found Philip. He didn't have to find Andrew because Andrew heard the testimony and just followed. He didn't have to find Peter because Peter was invited by his brother and he followed. But here he said, he finds Philip. When he finds Philip, he says to Philip, follow me. Again, in this character study, we see an obedience in Philip following. When Jesus says, follow me, Philip just does it. One of the lessons we want to learn here from Philip is answer the call. When God calls you to do something, answer. When I was a kid, they used to sing the song, when he calls me, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. When we look at Philip, we see that Philip was a man from Bethsaida. Now this city, Bethsaida, is the same place where Andrew and Peter are from. And so what happens in Bethsaida. Let's let me let me jump ahead right here to this lesson that we learn about Philip. Number one, where he's from. He's from Bethsaida. Now, <laughs> you've heard this said, it's not where you come from, it's who comes from there. You may have been born in a situation in a place huh, where it seems as though it's a bad place or what we would call a bad circumstance or a, a bad situation. But can I tell you, wherever you are, here's one of the lessons, wherever you are, how deep down you might be or high up or whatever the case may be, Jesus can find you wherever you are. I thought about the song. He said, where can I hide from your presence? If I ascend, you're there. If I descend, you're there. There is no place you can hide from God. Sometimes you might have different reasons for hiding. You may not think God sees you, but can I tell you something? He sees everything you do. He hears everything you say. He's God. And here it says Jesus finds Philip, but Philip is from Bethsaida. Now, we find this place Bethsaida and other portions of scripture. One of my favorite is he talks about them as being a people of unbelief and not having faith. He said, uh, I believe it was in John when he said, but thou, Bethlehem, but thou Bethsaida, Chorazin and Bethsaida, if the mighty works that have been done in you have been done in Sodom, they would have repented. Bethsaida was not a place of great faith. You may be or have been in a family where they didn't really know God or worship God, didn't go to church. Maybe you come from a situation where nobody really taught you the things of God. But can I tell you something? God can find you right where you are. Some of you can witness to that. God will find you when God wants you. He'll find you. Don't you know he knows exactly where you are? Can we stretch that a little bit? In the situation where you are right now. Even in the midst of all of this chaos that's going on in the world. And maybe you have some doubts and maybe you have some fears. And maybe you have some things that you don't understand. As we look at Philip's life, we're going to see you're not by yourself. Philip had some things he didn't understand. Look, 
when Jesus finds him, even though he's from Bethsaida, a place where not many people necessarily are believing, yet from that place, from that city, he finds Philip. We see that even where people are sometimes, you think they're not important. But you don't know who in their heart is yearning and seeking after God and wanting someone to come and reveal him to them and show them who he is. Here, Philip is from this place that don't have much faith, but I, I, I like Philip because when we read here in, in John 1, 43 down to 46, he said it was a city of, of um, Andrew and Peter, but Jesus says, follow me. Philip immediately, after obeying God, after obeying Christ, after obeying Jesus, he goes and finds Nathaniel. We shared this a little bit before. You see it pop up over and over again. When you, when you have discovered what it is you've been looking for, you want someone else to share. You want someone else to know about it. So Philip finds Nathaniel, and he says, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Clue. Philip must have been reading the word. Mm -hmm. He says, We found him of whom Moses and the prophets did write about. How would Philip have known that unless he had been reading Moses and the prophets, which at this time would have been the Old Testament? Philip already had a yearning in his heart, as many Jews did, for the Messiah. Even though he lived among people who lacked faith, he lived in the city Beth. Theater, whom Jesus said, because of your lack of faith, if you had believed in me, if you had done, if you had uh, the faith, if you had listened, he says, oh, I, if, 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 if the mighty works that have been done in you, if they had been done in Solomon and Gomorrah, they wouldn't have been overthrown. But you didn't believe. But yet amongst the city of unbelievers, you find Philip, who evidently had been searching the scriptures. For he was able to say, come, we found him. Nathaniel, we found the Messiah, the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. We found him. He recognized something. This is the man that I've been reading about. This is the man that I've been searching. This is the man that I've been looking for. And I want to say to somebody, you've been searching and looking and trying to find peace of mind. The peace that you're looking for is in Jesus. The solution, the answer that you want, it's in Jesus. And when you search the scripture, look, 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 look here, Philip. Philip could say, we found the Messiah. He didn't understand in a sense, and I understand, I'm not, I'm not going to knock this because we talked about a little bit before. Jesus said, the Bible says Jesus actually found Philip. But when Philip had been found by Jesus, oh, I found what I was looking for. You know, words can have different meanings. When I say I found, it's not that Jesus was lost. Philip may have been lost, but Jesus wasn't. But he discovered, this is the man that I've been looking for. This is the man that I've been reading about. Oh, here he is. We found the Messiah. It takes me back into the Old Testament when the Lord, I believe it was through Jeremiah. He says, seek me and you will find me. When you seek for me, when you have sought for me with your whole heart. 
There's some things you want to know about God. There's some revelation, some knowledge, some, something that you want to know more about in this whole thing about following Jesus. And he says, seek me. Seek me with your whole heart and you'll find me. God is not hiding from us. But he wants us to go after him. To search. He wants to be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Yeah, all of that. He wants you to discover him. He wants you to come to him. Search him. Search about. There, there's a place in scripture. He says, search the scriptures. This is what Jesus said. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. In the Old Testament you find Jesus. He says, when you search it, you'll find me. And Philip had been searching. He said, Moses and the prophets. I've been searching the law, I told you this before, the first five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He says, when you search for me, I'm there. I'm in the tabernacle. I am the rock. Oh, when you start reading the Old Testament, you see Jesus over and over and over again. Yes, in symbolism. Yes, in typology. But he's there. He says, I've searched these scriptures. And he said, now, Nathaniel, look, I found them. I found them. This is the Messiah, Jesus. And he says, uh, we have found the Messiah of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We're going to hit Nathaniel in a little bit, but let me bring him in right here because this is where he kind of, this is who Philip is talking to, his friend Nathaniel. <laughs> and Nathaniel has a question. And, and Philip don't try to answer all of Nathaniel's questions. Here's another lesson. You may not know all of the theological answers to people's questions. Some people ask questions to throw you off. Some people ask questions because they legitimately want to know. When you witness to someone, you may not be able to tell them everything they want to know. But here's the smart answer that Philip gave to Nathaniel. Come and see. Come and see. Oh, how important it is to invite people to come and see. Would to God that our churches would be places where people could come and see Jesus. Not See, our necessarily our personality or our fame or whoever we are. But that when they come to our church, they don't see hypocrisy. They see genuine love. They see genuine fellowship with Jesus. I want to be able to tell somebody, come and see. When you come to my church, you'll see the glory of God. When you come and follow me, you'll see what God can do. Come and see. I, 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 I recognize that there are several places in scripture where this, is, this phrase is repeated, come and see. When Jesus met the woman at the well and talked with her in John chapter 4 and she ran into the city and told everybody that she saw what God had did, what Jesus had done and who she had met. And they, she said, come and see. Come see. When Jesus was raised from the dead and uh, the woman came to the tomb looking and the angel said, come see the place. Come see. Oh, some people are not going to believe necessarily just by hearing, but they're going to believe because they see. Therefore, they need to see you 
They need to see you walking in the grace of God. They need to see you glorifying God. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. It is important. And Philip could say, come and see. He said, they'll see the glory of God. They'll see and they will worship God because they see him in you. Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see. <laughs> oh yeah, Jesus has a way of working to get to you. He is, he is performing and using people to get to you. To bring you in a closer relationship with him. Here we see Philip again. We talked about this last time. We talked about uh, Andrew. When the Greeks wanted to see Jesus in John chapter 6, when they wanted to see Jesus, <laughs> I think they must have understood and said these were Grecian Jews. Let me give you a little bit of history about this a minute. During this, uh, and just prior to this time, when the Greeks had ruled the world, they, they unified the world and this common language, the Greek language, so much so that the New Testament was written in the Greek language. When the Jews who now had their scriptures in Hebrew, because of the Greeks, they were able to get their scriptures translated from Hebrew into Greek, which we call the Septuagint. So now, those who were of Grecian descent could read the Old Testament, could read the Septuagint because that was the translation from Hebrew into Greek of the Old Testament. And Philip's name is a Greek name. So it's quite likely that somewhere along the line, his parents named him this Greek name for whatever reason. It, it means something about the horses. Um, for whatever reason, and, and you have to understand too that Herod had sons that were named, I think he had two sons that were named Philip. So maybe they liked Herod and they named their son Philip because of it. I don't know. But his name was Philip and it is a Greek name. It's not a Hebrew name. It's a Greek name. But we understand that the overwhelming culture was Grecian. Even though the Romans came and conquered the Greeks, the Roman paved roads so that, this is wonderful to me, God is always orchestrating all of this. He brings the world together in a common language, Greek. He paved roads using the Romans to pave the roads. He gives the, the Hebrews the scriptures. He brings it all together so that Jesus Christ in the fullness of time could come. Oh, I tell you, I, this is a sidebar. I was never a student of history. Um, the only time that I went to summer school was because I was failing history. <laughs> and I had to go to summer school to make up history. And so I didn't like history very much. And it wasn't until I got to Bible school when I understood I had a wonderful professor in Bible college that was um, Professor Shaw. He was my history teacher. And he made me see that history was his story. And as he began to teach history, I saw it in a whole new light. I saw the hand of God moving in history. And it changed my whole attitude about history. Now, I'm telling you, I love history. I love digging into history. I like watching the History Channel on TV. I like history because it means something to me now. It's about God working in human activity, in human affairs. And when you look at it good, you see the hand of God. He didn't just create the world and step back and just let everything happen or any kind of way it was going to happen. No, God was orchestrating. God... God, God was doing something. God was moving in all of history. You can see his mighty hand. And so here, I said that because even though Philip has a Greek name, God had used 
the Greek Empire to perform his cause and his purposes. Oh, this time goes away too fast, doesn't it? My goodness. Let me just put get get out of here. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do better. I know y'all don't mind. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me cut this timer off and we'll come back to it at another time. Yeah, there you go. We'll get back to Philip. We'll finish up Philip and we'll move more into Nathaniel. We talked a good bit about Nathaniel. But as you read the rest of this chapter, you'll see, you'll see Nathaniel some more. And we'll do that. We'll finish up Philip and we'll jump right into Nathaniel. And then we'll be able to move on to some of these other uh, disciples. We want to talk a good bit about James and John, the sons of thunder. We want to mention them because not all of them have uh, several mentions in scripture. We have their names, but we don't have them repeated in different scriptural accounts as we do with these that I'm showing you. But there are some where it says, and all of them, you know? So it's not, they didn't name one individual disciple. It was like the, the, the group together was like this, or the group together thought this. And so we would look at those passages and that way we can cover everybody. Excuse me. And when Jesus was teaching, he didn't just pull one disciple aside. At certain times you see, like here, you see him when he talked directly to Peter. He said something directly to Nathaniel. And we'll look at that when we come back together again the next time. But look at Philip and the lessons we learned from Philip. Philip obediently followed the Lord. He was found by Jesus. Somewhat distinctive from the others that we looked at. Jesus found Philip. But when he found Philip, Philip went and got his friend, Nathaniel. Philip was a studier of scripture. He said, Moses and the prophets spoke about him. Let's study the word of God. And listen, we got some more things to say about Philip. Are you going to join me when we go study Philip a little bit more? Or won't you come back? We're going to have a good time studying the lives of these men and seeing their diversity, yet their unity. Looking at our diversity and yet our unity. God bless you. Good night. <laughs>